Good morning, everyone. Uh, I hope you all are well in this crazy time we have right now. Um, this is this class today will be a follow up to the last two classes. Hopefully, you all attended those two, um, or you have some familiarity with the new RPA because it's shockingly new. Um, and we did two classes in the middle of December uh, that broke down both both sides of uh, or the, the, the two sections of the RPA. And now we uh, and, and there were so many questions that we couldn't get to all of them in about four hours worth of time. So we scheduled this presentation today to answer questions, frankly, that people had about the RPA and to and to hit some finer points of it. Um, so that uh, it's as valuable as possible. I need to tell you as we start off here today, uh, the kind of the lay of the land here. Uh, we are gonna go for only an hour today. We're not gonna go for the two hours it was originally scheduled. Uh, we likely will have a, a follow-up uh, q and if, if it's still necessary. And also I, I'll give you my phone number and my email address and I encourage you all to follow up with me. One of the, I've been, uh, here's my shameless profile here. Uh, on the, um, and, and a much better picture of me, I guess. Uh, I've been general counsel for this uh, association for, for, for several years now, and I work for you. So I, I do work for agents, realtors, um, the, the brokerage community. And so please follow up with me if you have questions, I'm happy to answer them or have someone in my office answer them um, so that we can get you uh, you know, in compliance and get you selling real estate because that's really what you're you're after. You're not after speaking to attorneys like me um, and 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 getting disputes. You're you're. It's much better if you obviously if you don't if you never have to talk to me. But if you do have to talk to me, I hope it's in the context of just a question. So the other way I want to structure this today is from our last two meetings. We had a number of questions that came through the chat and that they followed up with Shirley. And so I want to answer some of those questions first and then kick it off to what Shirley just indicated, which is the unmuting, ask questions. Um, you know, if I know the answer, I'm, I'm going to show you and, and walk through it with you. Um, but you, there may be a question I don't know, or there may be something that's still somewhat ambiguous. So I don't want you to be put off by the fact that sometimes things are a little bit unknown on these, especially when you get a brand new contract. I don't know all the time how, how something will be interpreted, but I'll give you my best estimate, my best understanding of how something might be interpreted and what you can do to protect yourself. So with that, um, I just wanna jump into this because we only we do only have that one hour. Um, so I'm gonna stop the share here so you can see, uh, you can see me here. And I'm going to uh, show you the, the actual contract because the first question that came in had to do with the grid format. So I'm, I'm gonna assume for the purposes of this, um, for the purposes of this presentation that you are familiar with the RPA. So I'm not going to, to you know, start with what it is and, and, and what, this, what the sections are. I'm gonna go right into the, the actual questions. So for all of you, the first question was if you're countering so you, you, we all love the counter, right? You, you, you send your offer over and the seller looks at 15 offers and the seller starts to counter things. And the question, the, the first question, actually, there actually were three questions on this same topic. So that's why I'm addressing it first because it was the most popular topic is if you are countering, do you counter by the grid number or do you counter by the paragraph number? And remember, there's there's two ways to look at this and i'm going to zoom in here so hopefully you can see this so what we're talking about the grid is this this big section the grid and we're talking about countering so let's say you wanted to counter price 3a that's that's a very traditional counter right is a counter of the price would you put in this is section 3a would you counter 3a or would you counter paragraph five, five B? And the, the way I would answer this is you, you should counter the, the grid number. Um, I don't see a lot of harm in also referencing the other number, um, or you know, which would be five or five B here, that paragraph, but I would counter three A. I would, so that if you're countering terms on this agreement, you should be countering 
the grid. And there's a good reason for that. The, re the reason for that is one, that's, that's the area that, that it's, it's, you know, that uh, the blank, but it's also the function of, of what the whole purpose of this new RPA is. The purpose was that all the negotiable terms will be in the grid. So that all, you know, I, I should say it's the only thing that a, that a buyer or seller should look at, but it's the, it's the handy area where, okay, if it's negotiable, it's in the grid. So on a counter offer, negotiable in the grid. So I would counter 3A in that context. Let me give you another example on that before we move on, because, and I'm going to show you down here. So if you're, because here's, here's an example where it might, it might not be as intuitive, right? So if you're doing, let's say you say, oh, 3A, I want it to be a million two instead of a million one. That's my counter. But what if you do something like L3? And, and, I, and I understand that you may not counter this very often. Um, or at least the, the part I'm going to talk about, but I want to give you an example of being specific in your counter offers. So if I said L, let's say I said I'm going to counter three L three, right? And I want that to be 15 days instead of 17 days, that which is the default, right? Well, what am I talking about? Am I because if you look at three L three, there's two items here which are independent. <laughs> There's investigation of property or informational access to property. And again, I, I know you don't informational access to property. Why are you going to counter that? But if you just said 3L3, are, have you created ambiguity now that, you know, are you countering? Which one are you countering? So I would be specific in my counter. I'd say 3L3 investigation of property is to be 15 days rather than 17 or 10 days or whatever, whatever the number may be that you counter there. So I, I think in addition to referencing that paragraph, I'd also want to be a little bit more specific in my counter so that, so that there's no question as to what I'm countering. I often see, I'll tell you in my practice, I often see disputes um, and that's where I'm coming from, by the way, I, I didn't, I didn't preface that in the beginning, but I, I come from the, from the, from the attorney world where I, I get the busted transactions. I get the dispute transactions. I get I get the fights, right? And one of the fights I often see is vague counteroffers, where people write in like, you know, fifteen days on on something, fifteen days on paragraph three or something like that. But they don't specify. They're, they're it's, it's like the, it's like they spent three minutes doing it, um, and they really and they have you know they have nine different counteroffer issues but none of them are very specific. And sometimes, and I, and I don't want to give you a ton of examples here because we have limited time, but a lot of times we get, we get disputes over that because those things are, are, are ambiguous or they, uh, or they, um, uh, you know, they contrast with other terms of the agreement. So just, if you are countering these terms, make sure you're, you're not doing that. Um, next item, I, I said I had a couple of these before we open it up. The next item was the the um, uh, the difference between a second residence and investment. There was a question of what is the difference between a second residence and an investment property. This is this occupancy type three three e three. Well, that's that should be a simple one. Um, a secondary residence is one that you're they're going to use for your your own purposes. An investment is typically something that you're either going to sell like a flip property or you're truly going to rent it um, you know as as a as an income property or as some other type of or you know or you're speculating on it for the future it's not something you're going to use as a vacation home for instance um, so that was the answer to that one the uh, the, the few more I have was the assignment clause. There was a question on the assignment and there were actually several questions on the assignment. And I'm gonna to move to it and I apologize. It looks like I'm scrolling really quickly because the assignment clause changed. And I don't want this to give a lot of people heartburn because I think they actually improved it. Uh, what they did was they, they updated this for the reality of the situation that a lot of people buy real estate and then they either or they make an offer on real estate and then they want to either assign it to their trust, which they either create during the transaction or that they already have, 
or they or they want to assign it to an entity. And this is particularly in the flipper world or in the investor world or just the income property world. They want to assign it to an, a their wholly owned entity. Um, and so what they did here was they said that that the bot and, and so you've often seen this people say, you know, it's Fred Fister, you know, the offer is coming from Fred Fister or a signee. We always played with that language or a signee to kind of give a heads up that we were probably going to assign this property. Um, they've now taken some of that away with this 23. And so the question that came down was, um, you know, do we, if we're going to send it to our trust, do we just give that trust information like we always did to the, um, to the title officer and the title officer will work with that? And, and my answer is yes. That's the way I read this. I don't, I don't see that has, as changing. The, what has changed is that uh, you need, as the buyer, you need to disclose this assignee, obviously. Well, I mean, that was always there, but you have to disclose this and you have to dis, uh, disclose the amount of monetary consideration if, if there is a, uh, if, if there's something, uh, if you are assigning it. And where that really comes from isn't from the trust world. So the, if you're doing this in the trust world, you, you didn't have that before. Where this is coming from is the flipper world, where there are some flippers out there, and we actually call them warehousers, um, where they will tie up a property is what we call it. They will, let's say they bid a million dollars for the property. And then during escrow, they look for somebody else to buy it for 1.1. Or something like that, and then on, and then they immediately, and then they, as soon as they find someone like that, that they then they assign that to that person, and that hasn't always been transparent, um, and that has sometimes been a problem, um, and so what they're telling, what they're saying here is that 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 first buyer, buyer number one, has to tell the seller that buyer number two is now buy, or that buyer number two, I guess the assignee is paying. X number of dollars to assign the contract. So um, anyway, that's that's the way the assignment works. Um, I, I'll go into more, I, I went into more detail on that in the other presentation, so I won't belabor the point, but just know that if you're doing it to the trust, like most people are in the residential world, uh, that really hasn't changed as, as to who you deliver the information to. Okay. One more I want to go through, and then I, I promise I will open this up. The, the last one was is somewhat of a complicated one, and this has to do with, and I'll show you this. This, this was a question that came up, and I apologize for the, how complicated this is, but I know this is an important one, so I, I, I hope you do follow along with this. The question was, okay, it, in the... The grid for contingencies, there is a five-day hard-coded um, review of seller documents after receipt. And the question was, can I change that, right? Can I, can I counter that? Can I reduce that to like one day? Or can I, can I um, uh, modify that in some way? And they didn't like the fact that it was, that it was hard-coded, I believe. And I think the reason why they did that, I had to look into exactly why they did that. And I, and I think the reason, why, and I'm glad, that's why I'm glad this was a Q&A after the fact. Um, because if you look at this, the way the, the seller documents, the seller documents include not only those material facts you're disclosing, but it also include things like the TDS. Um, and as you all know, the TDS has a statutory time frame that once you deliver the, the TDS, um, the, the TDS, that they have a, a time to release that contingency. And so uh, what I think what they were going after here was the fact that you can't modify that time frame for the TDS. You, you certainly could modify for other documents, but the TDS, and because this is all inclusive, so if you go actually to 14A here, you will see that 14A then paragraph 14a, sorry, for those who are following along here. If you go to Pat 14a, it specifies time frames and it specifies time frames for a number of different disclosures, including the TDS, mm -hmm. including other statutory time frame documents. And I think what they were trying to do here was being all inclusive. Um, 
So I would strongly encourage you not to try to counter and modify um, 3L4, paragraph 3L4 with that five days after receipt, because you may un unintentionally be uh, modifying the statutory time frame for something which you're which is against public policy um, which probably against is your is probably against your broker policy probably against your eno insurance and so before i was modifying something that's hard coded in here i would strongly strongly encourage you to talk to your broker on that your broker of record make sure that he or she is comfortable with you doing that and that your counsel is comfortable because you don't want to unintentionally do that. Now, is it possible? Uh, a lot of things are possible. Y yes, there are certain, you know, that review of seller documents. Um, yes, it, it's possible to modify some of those, but again, you don't want to modify the statutory timeframe ones. For instance, a TDS, it's three days if you deliver it in person, five days by mail. Um, you know, it's it just not something I, I don't think that's where you should be uh, monkeying around with this, um, with this agreement is modifying those, the, uh, what I would call the non-negotiables, right? They didn't put that as a negotiable document. Um, just deliver the documents and, and, and as early as possible. That's, that's really in my advice, rather than delivering, you know, a TDS, you know, later in the transaction, deliver it right up front. And that will take care of this issue for you. Okay, well, let me now open it up. Um, hopefully that has answered a number of questions. Um, it looks like we have a couple in the chat, um, but I do know that Shirley, um, well, let me answer this one real quick. It says another question about the second or investment property. What if client wants to buy a second property to put their senior parents in? Would that be investment property or a second property? Well, it really depends how they classify it is the way I would, I would uh, characterize it, whether they are making money or not. So if they put their parents in there, their senior parents, and they're charging their senior parents rent, and, and, you know, the, the, and there's a lease agreement and, all, and all, that, all that fun stuff, then I would say that's, that could be classified as investment property. But something you want to talk to your tax advisor about. Uh, but traditionally, that would probably be a second property because I don't know if I if I could get away with charging my mom rent for uh, for a property. But if I if I could, maybe I, maybe I'd call it an investment property. So uh, that, but that's to some extent that's really a tax question of how they're gonna how they're gonna because that that's really where it comes into play. And it's also it's also important for the loan. That's really where that's also coming into play is how's the loan going to be characterized. Um, so. The next question was, so just leave the name of the trust out of the contract and deal with it with the title officer before close of escrow. Yes, I, I, if, you know it, if you know it already, well, let me, let me back up. If you know it already, I, I don't see any reason why you couldn't just include it from the beginning um, so you don't have the issue. Um, if you don't necessarily have to though, now the contract allows for an assignment without it, you know, to that trust without having, uh, you still have to, it still has to be disclosed. It still has to be assigned, but you don't, but it's, it's by default. There's no, you know, there's no reason for the seller to refuse um, that, that assignment if it's to the trust. So um, yes, I, it, you could leave it out and, and just deal with the title officer before close of escrow and make sure that there is an assignment that is uh, part of the transaction and that can be done through escrow. So, but again, if you know ahead of time, um, I always like, if, if I know ahead of time, why create more paperwork for myself down the line if I know that we're gonna do it into the trust. But I understand the, the, the situation. Most people don't know ahead of time. They, they either create the trust during the transaction or they, they're still on the fence, right? They're so excited that they got the property that they, uh, that you know they haven't even thought of that yet, maybe. So um, anyway, let's. Uh, that looks like the only questions in the chat. So why don't we open it up, uh, Shirley? Okay, I don't have anybody raising their hand yet. But if you have a question one and want to ask live, raise your hand and we will unmute you so you can ask your questions to Fred.
Okay, well, while we're waiting uh, for, for someone to not be uh, shy, um, I'll, I'll go over another one and just interrupt me, Shirley, if, if someone answers the question. Another question that had come in was uh, regarding uh, the seller credit issue. If you, if you notice that there is a seller credit section here, I'm gonna see if I can show it for you. Uh, this was more of a comment from someone, but I but I wanted to highlight it because it it uh, they've really emphasized this now. It's it's not hidden anymore. Right now, it's front and center. This and what I'm referring to, by the way, is paragraph three G one, which is the seller credit for um, uh, uh, to the buyer. And what they've they, they've kind of left it open ended, right? It's you know it's seller credit to be applied to closing costs or other, right? Um, and they, so they're kind of inviting you to put in a uh, an or other. And there was a comment last time which I have to agree with um, that if you do that, <laughs> um, you you probably are going to get some lender or financing is, issues, or you possibly could. The lenders and, and financers, they, they typically only like to see seller uh, buyer credits for closing costs. Uh, now, certainly in my world, um, we do, we, you know, there's, there's other credits, there's, you know, septic credits, there's roof credits, there's, uh, all, there's different types of credits sometimes that come into play um, during, a, during these types of unusual transactions. But if you're doing a more of your run-of-the-mill transactions from a first-time buyer or someone with, you know, with, uh, you know, who's, who's, I don't want to say struggling, but, but having difficulty getting qualified. Uh, the last thing you want to do in there is get these buyer credits because that's, that could script your financing. So I, I certainly agree with that. So I would be very wary of doing anything with 3G1 that isn't very vanilla and which is a very, uh, is strictly for closing cost seller credit. Um, it looks like there's a question regarding the other Zoom class, uh, the other RPA classes. Now, um, I understand, Shirley, that they are, that they were recorded and are available through NSTCR. Can you talk, uh, talk about that just briefly? Absolutely. All the webinars that for the RPA, they can go to www.nsdcrealtorstv.com and review them at any time. I'll put the um, link into the chat. Okay, perfect. Um, now, there was a question here. There's a question. Can you remind us again about the RPA and termites? Since 2014, when the termite clearance was taken out of the RPA, buyer's agent wedge it in wherever they can. I view it as a continued issue. And do you have a way for listing agents to deal with this in the new RPA if clearances or similar language is added here? I, I think, it, and so I'm, I'm, I'm showing you where I, I think that you're referring to, to answer your question, would be in the allocation of costs. So what I what I, um, I I guess there's a two part question. One would be the who's paying for it, right? And the second was is it a contingency of the agreement? Um, so if we're looking at allocation of costs, I think that this could be uh, you could deal with it in the allocation of costs section here, uh, and this is the three Q section, is where who you know who would pay for this, for instance, if if that's what's the, the, the issue. If it's a contingency, if, if the contingency issue, um, I'm going to move up to that section here. Sorry, not enough screens here. Um, it, I, I think you'd have to put it into the contingency section um, in part of the investigation of property. So if you go to investigation of property or and or review of seller documents. So if we go to that section,
So the, the, way I'm, the way I'm looking at this is that, so the, the contingency section references the review of, of, of the buyer's investigations. And one of the buyer's investigations is, tw is in section 12. And so here are the buyer's investigations. So if you want, um, so this is a contingency already. And, you know, you, you can make the decision whether they buried it or not. Um, but if it is, a, in, you know, it is part of that investigation. So it's, it's something that would be taken care of. So let me try to see if I can synthesize that. So what I'm looking at is, is 12 A and B here. So if you're looking at that section, that's buyer's investigations. And if you go back to the grid, because remember all the negotiable terms are in the grid, buyer's investigations are 3L3, which is what we just, which is what we talked about a little bit earlier, actually. So this is where your, your investigation timeframe, if you wanted to uh, negotiate that or you wanted to increase that, that's where you could increase it. Um, if you wanted to allocate who was going to pay for it, that's in the Q section. So the way, you know, for instance, this is, this is the way I would reference that. I would say something like in Q2, you know, termite clearance report, you know, paid for by both or something like that, or paid for by seller. Um, and then I would make sure that that was in 3L3, I had enough time to get that report if it wasn't available and that it, I made sure that I didn't release that contingency um, because it may not, you may not be able to get that report that quickly. I mean, to be honest right now, it's, it's difficult to get anything done, um, much less a report from a professional. So, um, that's, that's the way I would reference that. I, I, I like the fact though, that you can negotiate. It's not buried anymore. Um, you know, some other people may have opinions on that, but, but I like the fact that the grid keeps everything front and center. So that's where you're going to be negotiating that particular term, but you can reference it. So for, for that to, hopefully that was a roundabout way of answering that question that negotiate it there, negotiate in L, um, uh, pay for it in Q and read about it in 12. Any additional questions? Uh, that was termite clearance. Uh, while we're waiting for another question, I did have, there was another comment that we received regarding uh, loans and how, and, and, and I'm going to share your frustration with loans, um, that the loan issues are all uh, calendar days rather than business days. Um, and there was a comment that lenders don't, don't work on the weekends, um, which <laughs> is Normally true, yes. Um, and so I think you have to, knowing that ahead of time, I think that's part of your, your, your discussion with your buyers, because I've seen a lot of this, I'll tell you this in the last, uh, last year, really, uh, while the market's been you know, completely on fire, is the, the issues we're getting, we're getting deposit issues, but we're getting a lot of lender issues, the lender just not being able to perform. The lenders, you know, I've had people want to sue lenders left and right because the lenders aren't, you know, they, they've said, oh, you're pre-qualified. Oh yeah, we'll get this done. And then, you know, and they don't, um, they get backed up. They, they, their underwriter says they can't and they've left, you know, according to the agents that they're calling me and, and their, and their clients, you know, they've left them in the lurch and they're looking for other al alternatives. And it's, it's been quite challenging. And, I, I'm not suggesting everyone sue lenders. I'm suggesting that you talk with your clients if they're if if this is a real issue, if this is an important issue, that you talk to them about releasing these contingencies. Um, and I know you do that already, but I, but emphasize it because the these loan contingencies are are very short. 17 days. The you know you're not going to get the loan in 17 days from start to finish. And you know, or you know, I guess you could, but most people aren't going to get that loan in 17 days. And so, if you're if you're releasing that contingency, knowing what that really means with your client, that okay, if we if we release this and it's still 
it's, you know, you're still up in the air of whether you're going to get that loan, you may lose your deposit if we do this, because 17 days is a very short time frame. So I would certainly have that conversation with them. Um, there's a question here um, from Terry Fox, it looks like, uh, regarding item 3L2, removing appraisal contingency. If appraisal contingency removal box is checked, what does that, what does the paragraph below the uh, FVAC mean? So let's take a look at that. Um, for all of you that are looking at this. Um, so here, uh, the appraisal contingency, and it says if, so if you, if you check this box, I think that's the, the question. If you remove the, um, uh, if you remove the, eliminate the, the appraisal contingency, um, so there's no appraisal contingency, the FVAC, uh, there, the cancellation rights with regard to that. I think that's the question. The FVAC form is the, uh, you're, I'm racking my brain. That's, that's the financing. Um, that, that's essentially the, the, I believe one of the loan contingency documents. I have to remember what the, I don't have my book in front of me for the, the FVAC form. Um, but I think that's one of the financing contingency forms. And so what I, what I believe they're discussing there is the loan and the financing contingency are separate. Uh, or I'm sorry, the loan and financing. The loan and appraisal contingencies are separate. Um, and I like that in this, in this uh, context because those are really two separate things. Now, every, we all know they're related, right? If you probably doesn't appraise, the, the lender won't give you the loan or they won't give you the loan as big as you want, but they are really two separate things. And so I, I think what they're trying to emphasize here is that if you remove the appraisal, that it doesn't necessarily take away the loan contingency um, rights, which is important because uh, just because you decide, you know, that the appraisal is not important, you still got to get a loan, right? Um, so I think that's what that's all about. Now, if you want to check them all, right, if you want to remove them all, go right ahead, right? There's a box for that, um, you know, and you can remove or waive all contingencies with the CR attached. For those of you that are paying cash and, and want to be extremely aggressive, they still have that, that flipper option or that all cash buyer option, I should call it, not the flipper, the all cash buyer uh, who doesn't want to review anything um, and just wants to buy the property. Um, so there's a, there's a question, the FVAC is specific to FHA and VA loans. Um, that's okay. So that's, that's where that form is. That's why I wasn't as familiar with it. it that rarely comes up in, in my practice. Uh, we don't get a lot of disputes over FHA and VA loans. Um, so so thank you, Pamela. Um, that's that's with regard to they they still need to approve, um, so they still may uh, have some cancellation rights there. Um, I on, honestly we don't do a lot of FHA and VA type loans in our in our practice. There's just not a lot of disputes. There there those are very um, those are very those are highly regulated and they're not they're not a lot of paint by numbers like a lot of the other transactions are. And so honestly, we don't get a lot of disputes over FHA and VA. Uh, but if you are um, in that field, uh, please review that uh, FVAC form. Um, let's see, the next question we have, oh, they, they put it in both. Uh, so thank you, uh, Pamela Frazier for that. That's, that's important information for everyone here. Um, additional questions. Let's see. Don't see a question from Shirley. So I will add another question that came in. Um, the, this had to do with uh, solar, the, the, uh, solar and where is that located in this document? And so let me, uh, let me show you where it's in 8G. So then I'll, then I'll phrase the question here. So there was a question of 
it is is this a contingency is the uh you know if you're gonna if you have leaned uh, if you have lean solar, is that a contingency of the transaction? And indeed it is. And this is where I want you to focus on here. Um, this section here, buyer review, and this is buyer review of leaned, of leased or leaned items contingency. And basically what it's saying is that the, uh, you know, if you, if you have something like that, and really we're talking about solar most of the time, there are other things that could be leaned or leased, but I would say in the in the residential um, the residential field most of the time it's going to be solar that that this is a by default this is a contingency right now again this can be countered this could be uh, you know this but it's the type of thing or this could be released but I'll tell you it's not a good idea to do that um, because getting you know I, I've seen a number of disputes between the lessor of the of the uh of the solar and the new buyer and no it's not mine yes it is it's attached to the property you come and get it those type of disputes um which i i think that you really should avoid uh because they they tend to have blowback onto the agent because invariably the the new buyer says that the agent didn't tell me or the agent uh uh, didn't advise me that I was assuming this or that I wasn't assuming this. Um, I, I tell people, and I do this in my other classes where I do red flags class, that if you see solar on a property, that's that's somewhat of a red flag from the beginning um, and find out, uh, not a bad red flag necessarily, but, but something that you need to investigate. Who owns it? Um, and let me see the documentation as to who owns it or who leases it. Let me see that documentation so that we can take care of it from the beginning. And I like the fact that they have now in uh, in 8G here, they've made a good uh, effort to um, uh, to make it clear that this is a uh, contingency of the transaction. Um, there's a question from Sherry Dolan. Why did they remove the confirmation of acceptance? And I think what you're referring to, let, let's let's see exactly what you're referring to here. I think what you're referring to is on the last page. So I think you're referring to this acceptance of the offer. Um, and, and I'm not sure exactly um, what you're referring to the confirmation perhaps you're referring to the offer well maybe you clarified it um no there's no clarification that but i think what you're referring to is the is this section here offer not accepted um or you're referring to the fact that um you know here's the acceptance of the offer so you have the buyer signature and if you have the seller signature, um, I, I'm not sure exactly why that wouldn't be a acceptance of the offer. Um, but that that's where I would look at this is that if the seller signs, that's an acceptance and delivers it back to the buyer, that would be an acceptance of the offer. Um, you know, obviously you can, this is, and I'm looking at paragraph 33, by the way, hopefully you're following along here. But if you do a seller counter offer, if you do the backup offer, that's where you would check it here um, in 33A. Um, it looks like, um, yes, I, I think I think um, I, I think that answers the question. Uh, there's a question regarding there has not been a problem with with own solar, correct? Um, I, I'm not sure if, if, uh, if I could, <laughs> there could be a problem with, with own solar, but I think what you're, what you're getting at is if they own it, it's not leased, does it go with the property? And I, and, and the answer would be, would be yes on this, unless it was specifically excluded. And that would be extremely unusual. I mean, um, to the extent that they, you know, just removing solar is, is, I heard is is such a process. I, I don't I don't do that for a living, but I've heard it's it's uh, 
it, it's extremely cumbersome, it damages the roof typically, and it's probably not something you're going to be doing, but it's, but it's possible, uh, I guess. Uh, or if there's, so, if there's a solar array that's not attached to the roof, that's probably easier to remove. And I guess it could be removed, but typically that would, you know, by default in this contract, that's going with the property. So I, I don't see that as a, um, I guess it's, it, I, don't, I don't want to characterize it as not a problem, <laughs> but it's, uh, I don't think it's a problem for the transaction. Um, there's a question from, uh, Ellen Kiss that says, do all the forms populate when you check a box that require additional forms? So I've heard two things on this. I've heard that, yes, it does in zip forms. I have not used it in the last couple of weeks with the new form, but, but that was certainly the intent. And I understand that is working. What's not working, I understand, is the in, internal hyperlinks. Maybe they have fixed that. Um, but the intent of this entire contract, and I've heard this from CAR, uh, from, from uh, their information, and from when they, when they showed us a copy of this, for those of you that, uh, that didn't know this, they, they typically show a copy of this to the attorneys uh, several months before they released something like this. And they, one of the things that they promised us was that, oh, when you check these boxes, it's going to pre-populate, so you'll have the ability to, um, uh, to automatically uh, incorporate these forms. For instance, you know, if you go up to um, something like, you know, in the contingency section, you click the CR, that CR then should populate in zip forms, and then you should be able to automatically um, fill that out. Just like you have, I, I you know, I know that you've been doing that. Uh, they've pre-populated forms in the past, but but this this is supposed to be that on steroids. It's supposed to make it easier for you. I'm not sure it does. Um, that's something we can we can certainly debate whether this this uh, document does make it easier for you to fill out or whether it's just complicated things now. But but if you see things like uh, uh, you know if you see these check boxes, they, they're supposed to pre-populate for you so that you can then fill them out because they become part of the transaction. Let me give you another example while we're waiting for another question here. Um, like for instance, the one that everyone loves, right? This is near and dear to everyone's heart, the contingency of sale of buyer's property, the COP form. Um, so 3L8, you'll see where it has the, the, um, the COP form attached. I understand if you check that box, it, it should populate the COP form so that you can fill out that form, which, which of course there will be no disputes over, right? I'm sure there'll be no disputes over the, the contingency of a sale of another property to buy this property. Um, and I, I joke because that has often led to a number of disputes. Um, it's second only to the lease back um, you know, as, as the number of disputes that we get, the lease back is, is probably been the worst, um, or, or maybe the best, depending on which way you're looking at it for disputes during the coronavirus pandemic. Um, question here, let's see. We got a new question here. What is the role of the title of title escrow and solar is owned? regarding title to solar and warranty transfer. I guess they only deal with it if there is a lien. That's my understanding. I, I, don't, I don't see the role of title or escrow getting involved in that. Um, it, it would typically be part of the uh, property. Now, if I were the buyer's agent, I would want the paperwork. That's, that's one of the things when I, when I say it's a red flag, if I'm a buyer's agent and I'm going to the property and I see solar on the roof and the, and the seller agent says, oh, no, don't worry, it's, it's, it's owned. It's wholly owned by the buyer, or by, I'm sorry, by the seller. The first thing I wanna do is I say, okay, what's the warranty? And you know, give me proof, you know, give, me the, give me the written warranty. Is it transferable? Um, sometimes they're not. Um, and give me the, you know, give me the receipt, give me the information that I, that I can confirm that this is actually owned because by default in this contract, that should transfer just like anything else, like any other part of the property. Um, but it's unique in the fact that the warranty may not transfer. So it's something that you're going to want to look at that specific warranty 
or you're going to have your, actually going to want to have your client look at that warranty um, and advise them that if they have you know legal questions about that, what do they do? They you know consult with their attorney, uh, not giving legal advice to them as to whether that warranty will transfer or not, particularly if it's complicated. Um, but that's the way I would I would answer that question is I don't, I don't see a role for the title or escrow officer in that in that uh, review. Uh, a second question though by Barbara Zuckerwise was if agreements are written as non-contingent, I assume that non-contingent umbrella would also remove the solar contingencies, et cetera, which are stated by default. Does it remove TDS requirements, strapping, et cetera? Yes, so yes, so the contingency would um, it, if you did do a broad con contingency uh, release, you are releasing all, you, you know, conceivably you'd be releasing something like a solar contingency, but it, do, it would not remove those statutory contingency, for instance, the TES. Um, so, and, and strapping, yes. So those, that, with those limited statutory contingencies, if, if they're required, uh, they're still required. You're not releasing those, but that's a very limited, um, that's a very, that's, you know, that's a very limited way to be, uh, uh, what's the right word for that? If, if you're releasing those things, you probably don't care about the TDS. If you're releasing all the, all the contingencies um, uh, right up front with your offer, you're probably not um, but it's very possible you, you get that TDS and you see something that you don't like and, or your buyer doesn't like and you cancel the transaction for that. That is, that is one out. That, is, that would be the one out. Um, there is a comment that the, the COP form needs to be revised. I believe it is one of the you know, 72 forms that they revised. I, I think I read that, that it was, there were 72 forms that were either revised, created, um, during the, in December of 2021, it's not like you don't have enough to do, right? Um, uh, you have to, you have to look at 72 different forms. I think that was the number, but I think the CLP form was slightly revised. I'd have to look at the list again. They're it seems to me that they're constantly, uh, tweaking that form because they know that there are constant disputes over it. Um, and, and also the, uh, and so I believe it was, there was a helpful um, edit on that, but they, I think they know that there are constant disputes on that and the whole lease back issue. Um, and then the, of course um, uh, that was exasperated by the, by the pandemic. So um, that, that probably will be the subject of another, another class. Surely, I hope you're listening. Uh, that may be another uh, subject is, is, is the lease back conundrum and the, and the, um, uh, the COP and those type of contingencies. The only hesitance I would say with, with doing a presentation on that specifically or, or having you all look at that is it's, 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 very, it's very transaction specific. What happens in each transaction, it's, it's not as cookie cutter as, oh, there, you know, this is the thing that always happens. It's, there's always some variable that comes into play that's unique to that situation that that it, and that's why i think they're struggling with the cop form why they're struggling with the lease back forms while they're struggling with those possession what, what i call the possession forms um the uh uh, uh because it, it's just so it's it, it it's hard to create a form around personalities let's just put it that way um there was a question here Uh, with your experience, are there any items of importance that you think we should pay attention to on the new contract? Well, gosh, that's a broad question, um, but thank you. Um, I, I would say the uh, the items of importance are is the grid. I, I get to know the grid. If if you're going to do one thing, that's that's what I would do. I would I'd really learn the grid and how it works because that's what's really new. So for instance, like the arbitration clause, liquidated damages, um, you know, how mediation works, all that is pretty much the same. What's really new and what an agent really should learn on this, uh, whether they've been doing this for 40 years or four months, they should be learning the grid because that is 
how this whole thing works. And that's what they're your, the questions that you're going to get, I think, from your clients. That's what they're going to negotiate. That's where they're going to reference. So I would become extremely familiar with saying, oh, yeah, it's 3L2. That's where that section is. Um, I, I would get really familiar with that part of the um, uh, transaction because that's that's really where you're going to get the questions. Um, now, <laughs> to, to answer the question even broader, be familiar with the entire thing. I mean, the reason why we're doing th we've done three classes in less than a month on this, and their CER has got a ton of classes on this, and everyone's um, on the RPA is that this is the one form that you really use and, every, and you really need to know. You can, you can skate by with not knowing, you know, one of the other 300 forms or, or not, not using it every day, but the RPA is the form you use every day if you're selling real estate. And, and being very familiar with this contract is extremely important for your clients um, so that you can guide them because they're not necessarily going to know when they open this up, even the experienced ones are going to look at this and be like, wait, wait, I bought 20 pieces of real estate. Why did they change? You know, what, what form did you just give me? This isn't the RPA. It's probably going to be their first reaction. Their second reaction is going to be, oh, there's a grid. What's that? Can you explain this to me? And so that's where I think it's really important where you add value is walking your, your even your experienced uh, buyers and sellers through this grid process because that's really what's new. Um, okay, there's se several other questions here. See if I can answer them. Uh, this is from Deborah. She says, if a seller comes into ownership by inheriting the property, will he be released from providing a TDS? Well, that is if they're TDS exempt. So if they're TDS exempt, there's, a, there's another form for that. Um, that hasn't changed. So um, the answer is it's possible. It depends if they're TDS exempt. So, but they're, but they don't get out of, you know, it's not a get out of jail free call uh, uh, card. So th that really isn't the subject of this, but, but uh, just to let you know, Deborah, that hasn't changed. Uh, that is still a, uh, that's still, that, that, that process remains the same with this new uh, form. Uh, Barbara Zuckerweiss says, I just noticed far right column of grid section L specifically re re references solar, et cetera, vis-a-vis -vis contingency removal as part of all or non-contingent offer. L7 on the left referencing large block on the right. So let's look at that. So what she's referring to here is 7L review of leased or leaned items, if you can see at the bottom, such as solar panels. So that's that's what we were looking at um, on on 8G. Remember, we were looking at we were looking at the specific paragraph rather than the grid. And thank you for referencing us back to the grid because as you can see, Barbara, that's that's the way it works, right? So the you look at the uh, we were looking at we were looking at where it is in the contract, and then you reference back to the grid. But that's a that's a really good uh, catch there. That that's where it is. It's three L seven. That's where the, that's where you're going to reference eight paragraph eight G for those leaned or leased items. But it's the same contingency period, right? So it's the same seventeen days. And I, and to be honest, I know some people don't like that because seventeen days sounds like a very short period of time, and they don't like that. You know, they have to learn new contingency dates. But I'll tell you, in, in my practice selling, uh, helping sell these type of properties and also selling commercial properties, I always find it helpful that there is one date where everyone can focus on rather than five dates, right? It's, it's, it's much more, it's much easier to make a mistake with when you have different contingency release dates than if you have one contingency release date and it, release date and it's for everything. So that's, so they, they've now, um, looked at that apparently, and they've decided to make everything 17 days unless you modify it, right? You're, you're still allowed to pay by numbers, but um, you, you uh, by, by default, it's 17 days. So it looks like we have, uh, do we have any more questions? Because we're right at the end of our one hour um, time frame. 
Um, I'll, I'll make sure to put up my number here at the, uh, if I can, I see here, if I can stop this share, because I do want you to have my contact information uh, in the event that you need to, you have additional questions. And again, I'm, I'm more than happy to help um, anyone with additional questions. Let's see if I can put this up here while I, before I start talking about it. Um, but I'm more than happy to help you with additional questions and to um, help you understand this, this contract or really answer any of the questions that you may have with your clients. Uh, one of the things that, that uh, I do in my practice is we have a number of attorneys who, uh, who answer questions for um, our clients who, who often are real estate brokerages, large and small, and their clients during the transaction. So there's my number. There's, there's my website. Like I said, we have a number of other attorneys there as well. And there's my contact information, white and bright. Um, it's just fwp at whiteandbright.com. Uh, you'll get a hold of me and I'll get back to you just as soon as possible. So I thank you all for attending this relatively short Q&A, but I hope it was helpful. Um, like I said, uh, we, we will likely have another one of these as we go through, um, but feel free to attend any, any of the other NSDCR classes that are coming up. Uh, Shirley laid out a number of them. Um, it's a great benefit for the, the best uh, uh, association here um, in uh, in Sedio County. Thank you, Fred. Thank you. Appreciate it.